Okay. Now, in the previous video, we spent some time discussing some general properties of, of sensory receptors. And now what I want to talk about is essentially how we get sensory information to the brain. Because remember, we said that uh, when we were talking about receptors, that a big part of this is understanding our environments, understanding that, you know, the changes that occur between our internal and external environments and not only understanding them, but responding to them. Okay. Cause if you remember the, the, the major functions of the nervous system, we said that they are sense, you know, that basically there's sensory functions, there's, you know, motor output functions, and then there's integration. Okay, so when we say integration, basically processing. All right. Now, so we so in the, in the previous video, I talked about basically some basic some basic properties of sensory receptors and how they work, and we gave a very very brief example of one type of uh, uh, penicillin corpuscle, and. Um, so now what I want to talk about is how once we basically transduce a stimulus, how do we get that information to the brain? Okay, how do we get that information to the brain? So that's going to be the focus on this, hence the title General Somatosensory Pathways. And then I want to, and then I want to talk about a little bit of an application to one of these, uh, or to this topic in pain, because pain is an interesting topic to discuss, you know, due to the neuroanatomy, neurophys of this, and I mean, pain is just a, it's something we all experience in our everyday life. You know, I mean, and, and what's going to be important to understand about these pathways of pain is one, I mean, just how pain works, but two, when it comes to medical treatments of pain, some things we can do to try to alleviate pain, okay, and how we basically tie pain into memory as well. Okay, so on that note, let's kind of get going and talk about some general somatosensory pathways. All right, now, when we talk about these somatosensory pathways, what we're realistically talking about is how do we get information from the periphery, from our body, into the brain so we can process it, okay? And typically, when we're getting information from our body into our brain, this is almost always done in a three-neuron circuit, okay? So what I'm saying is, is there's basically one neuron synapsing with another neuron, another neuron synapsing with another, okay? So basically there's three nerves in these pathways, okay? The fourth order neuron is essentially the processing itself. Okay, Be taking place in the cerebral cortex. Okay, so these first three neurons are basically going from the body to the brain, okay? So the first neuron is essentially going to be the sensory receptor. Okay, it's essentially going to be the, the, the receptor. And there are two general pathways that these receptors take that I have mapped out for you in a couple different slides in a second. Um, one is called, the one they, they either go through is called the dorsal column system or the anterolateral systems, okay? But either way, both those systems are going to wind up going to the, going to the cerebral cortex, essentially the somatosensory cortex for interpretation. Okay, so next then, excuse me, the second order neuron, so this first order neuron is going to go from a sensory receptor to the spinal cord. Okay, and depending on which of the pathways we're talking about, this sensory neuron may go from the spinal cord all the way up to the brain stem or from the spinal cord to the, you know, or I'm sorry, um, ah, forget I said that. Okay, so the second order neuron is essentially going to be found either in the brain stem Okay, the brain stem or the spinal cord itself. Okay, so what we're saying here is some sensory neurons are going to are going to go right to the spinal cord and they're going to synapse immediately with another neuron and go up through the brain stem and the thalamus, okay? Or some neurons are going to go from, you know, from sensory receptor all the way up the spinal cord, all the way up to the brain stem where they'll then synapse with the second order neuron, okay? Now, the second order neuron is essentially going to go to the same place, okay? The destination for the second order neurons are the thalamus, 
Okay. Now, you know, remember when you're studying brain anatomy, the thalamus is a, is an extremely important area of the brain. Okay, because remember, the thalamus is essentially a relay center for somatosensory information. Okay, for somatos oops for, for somatosensory input. Okay. Um, and understanding this basic neuroanatomy and understanding these relays, well, let me and is will help you understand why we're able to tell the difference between touch, pain, temperature differences, chemistry changes, and all that stuff. Because essentially, these neurons are traveling through you know similar tracks of the spinal cord, okay, and then they're going to the thalamus, and then what the thalamus is going to do is it's going to project these neurons to different areas. For example, different areas of the cerebrum. So for example, let's say we're talking about vision. Okay, these visual pathways will eventually go to the thalamus, okay, and then the thalamus will, will basically radiate these visual pathways to the occipital lobe, okay. If you're experiencing pain, okay, these pain pathways are gonna go from a sensory receptor, you know, up through the brain stem, and then to the thalamus. And then the thalamus is going to project neurons out to the somatosensory cortex of the parietal lobe. All right. And to different areas of the of, of the different areas of the of the uh, somatosensory cortex as well. Okay, so that's essentially how the brain differentiates between pain, touch, you know, uh, different pressures, different forms of touch, and so on, is where are these neurons, where are these pathways projecting to? Okay, and that's essentially what the third order neuron is. We're going from the thalamus, okay, to, these, to the cortex itself, you know, specifically in this situation, the somatosensory cortex of the parietal lobe. Okay, that's how we differentiate different stimuli. So that is so re recept so these receptors travel again, you know, up these different pathways to the thalamus and the thalamus projects these 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 sensory pathways to appropriate areas of the brain for us to interpret. And then, like I said, the fourth order neur neurons then would essentially be a group of inner neurons within the cerebral cortex that are going to basically form the circuitry to allow us to consciously perceive a stimulus, okay? Now let's kind of take a look at some arbitrary maps of what we just talked about. Okay, so here's what here's the uh, the dorsal column system. So essentially, fine touch, pressure, and proprioceptive information will be traveling up this system into the brain. Okay, so the so basically by taking a look at this, what would be the first order neuron? Here, here, or here? Where's the first order neuron? Obviously, we're going from receptor, okay, up. So this would be the first order neuron, okay? So basically, this neuron, this sensory receptor, you know, like I said, whether it's a mechanoreceptor, um, a proprioceptor, a muscle spindle, Golgi 10, whatever it may be, okay? Now, you can now, what you notice is that, that this receptor will enter the spinal cord and it will travel all the way up the spinal cord where it will eventually go to the brain stem. Okay, and basically this this nerve is going to terminate in the brainstem and synapse with the second order neuron. Okay, now notice what happens here. This is essentially what we would consider the midline. I know it's not exactly down the middle, but you'll have to bear with my art here. Um, so now what happens at the level of the brain stem, you know, with this dorsal column system, the second order neuron crosses over at the level of about the, typically the medulla, and passes upwards towards the thalamus, okay, passes upward towards the thalamus, all right. So that would be the second order neuron, and then and then the thalamus will then project to the, you know, to the cerebral cortex, hence the third order neuron. Okay, and again, the area of the cortex, and this would be the fourth here, the area of the cortex we're talking about is the um, somatosensory cortex. 
Okay, so what would be the clinical significance of understanding the, the basic neuroanatomy of this dorsal column system? Let's think about this for a second. Let's say someone has an, let's say someone has an injury to their spinal cord within the system, and the injury basically, let's say we cut off, you know, the, the spinal cord is transected, and, or maybe there's just damage to one side of the spinal cord, and this neuron is damaged right here. Where is the person going to, you know, so basically you can tell they're going to have problems interpreting fine touch, pressure, maybe have coordination issues on that side. Okay, let's just go with touch. All right, let's say they have some bizarre feelings. Let's say there's numbness and tingling, okay, you know, whether they said a herniated disc or damage of the cord. Where are they going to feel that, where are they going to feel the signs or where the symptoms going to be? They're going to be ipsilateral. Okay, remember lateral means side. And ipsy means same. Okay, so let's think about this now. Let's say this individual has an injury in the brain stem, okay, along this pathway, in the brain stem or higher, okay, in the brain stem or higher. And the injury is on, you know, so let's say this would be the right side, and we'll say this is the left, okay. If there's an injury on the left side of the brain stem, whether it's through some kind of ischemic attack, infection, a stroke, whatever, whatever it may be, okay, what's going to happen then is the pain is going to be felt on the right, okay, or numbness or whatever is going on. All right, so this is so basically what you're noticing here are these pathways, you know, and the other pathways as well are going to cross over um, on their way to the cerebral cortex as well. That's why when someone has a stroke, for example, and they have brain damage, you see the effects on the opposite side, okay, because all these ascending pathways, all these afferent pathways okay, are going to eventually cross the midline on their way to the cerebral cortex, okay? The big difference between this dorsal column system, besides the fact that it's, you know, dorsal, is the fact that it doesn't cross, is that the neurons in this system, you know, don't cross over, or the second order neuron, I should say, doesn't cross over until the level of the brain stem. Okay, so if there's ever a spinal cord injury to this system, you're going to see the signs or symptoms ipsilaterally. You're going to see it on the same side. All right. So, so basically, here's the dorsal column system, and again, you can see the the, the 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 how the circuitry works when we're getting this information up to the cerebral cortex. Now we come over and take a look at the anterolateral system. Okay, meaning in the front side of the spinal cord. Basically, this is you know you know pain, temperature, and light touch. Okay. Now, what do you notice here? Again, let's let's put these let's put these neurons in order. Remember, the first order neuron is always going to be the receptor. Okay, so we got the first order neuron, and then we got the second order neuron. Okay, after the first, so this right here represents a synapse. Should have mentioned. Pardon me, I should have mentioned that before. Okay, and then the second order neuron, like the other second order neuron, goes up to the thalamus. Okay, and then the third order is basically, or the third nerve, neuron in this pathway, pathway, sorry, is being projected from the thalamus all the way up to the cerebral cortex, okay? And then remember, the fourth order neuron, essentially, again, same thing, somato, you know, is the somatosensory cortex, okay, and the conscious interpretation of the stimulus, okay? And again, there's different areas of this cor area of the cortex as well. Now, again, the, the, the clinical relevance of this. So, if there is damage taken to this system, okay, now, where, so basically, if the damage is in the second order neuron, it's more than like, you're going to more than likely see the effects almost immediately contralaterally because this, because this system crosses over at the level of the spinal cord and then travels all the way up to the brain on, you know, on the side of the crossover. Okay, whereas you saw in the, in the dorsal column system that the second order neuron doesn't cross until the level of the brain stem. Okay, and those of you who are going into to, you know, whether you're pre-med or you're going into neuroanatomy, neurophys, and things like that. This is why it's important to understand these, um, these various, uh, just at least for now, the basics of these pathways, because that'll, you know, because depending on where injuries occur, you know, it'll vary, the, 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 
how you see the injury and how the person experiences the injury will depend on how on where this crossing over is taking place. Okay, but you get the general gist of how we get this sensory information to the brain. A receptor is activated. It transduces the information, you know, from, from the receptor to its axon to the spinal cord. And then the information is synapsed in a three-nerve three circuit from receptor all the way to the brain. Okay, all the way to the brain. Now, why is it advantageous to be designed like this? Why not just have the receptor, why not just have this go from receptor all the way up? Okay, think about this. This would be a this would be a bad setup, okay? Because I mean, think of the chances of injuring this one very very long axon, okay? That's so it's nice, you know, so it basically it's just a lot better, okay, you know, to have this three circuit setup here. All right? So that's how we get somatosensory information from the body to the brain. Okay? Remember understand this concept of crossing over. All right, and now let's let's uh, apply this concept to pain. Okay, you know, let's talk about a little more specific and talk about pain. Okay, now pain, if we want to, if we want to give pain a definition, it is a discomfort caused by tissue injury or noxious stimuli that cause or have the potential to cause pain, and pain typically leads to an evasive action. Okay, so let's break that down. Okay, tissue injury or noxious stimuli, so essentially chemicals. Okay, when we're saying tissue injury, that could be infarction. Okay, it could be tearing. Okay, it could be increased, let's abbreviate this, increased pressure, you know, because of a, a tumor or edema, all right, or varicose vein, you know, blood buildup. All right, when I say infarction, I'm essentially saying tissue death due to a decrease, and I'm abbreviate this, blood flow. Okay, I mean, the tearing, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, the tissue tears, okay, like a cut. All right, so basically anything that can damage tissue or a chemical stimulus, you know, like inflammatory chemicals or other chemicals, that cause that, that have the potential to cause pain. Now, pain leads to an evasive action. So basically, you're, you're doing the math here, which is pretty easy to figure out, that these stimuli are obviously not conducive to our well-being. All right, so these stimuli, in turn, are damaging, are, are damaging our tissues, damage, damaging our bodies, hence the evasive action. Okay, now pain is good. Pain is a good thing. Okay, pain is a good thing because it, it allows us to be aware of what's going on. Okay, pain is an adaptive, protective response. Okay, I mean, if you are cooking and you're not paying, I do this sometimes. I mean, if I'm frying something in a frying pan, all right, you know, let's say I'm making a stir fry. I'm frying up my food and I'm talking to somebody or I'm just in la-la land and I'm not paying attention. And I go to grab the handle of the, of the pot. And I and you know and instead of you know and, and instead of grabbing the plastic, I put half my fingers on the plastic, and I grab some of the metal that's too close to the the actual hot part of the pot. I'm going to burn my tissue. Okay, but let's say I didn't notice this. You know, then that then I just sit there and burn and burn and burn and burn my skin, and I could burn it without being aware of it all the way down to the bone. And then now all of a sudden I break my skin apart. I open the floodgates for bacteria and other harmful organisms to get in and hurt me. All right, so evasive actions, all right, so that's why pain is good. It allows us to be conscious, essentially, of what is harming us, all right. Now, adaptive, it's important that pain is adaptive as well, um, you know, on a physiologic and a conscious level because we don't want to experience pain. I mean, unless you're a really weird masochist, all right, we don't want to be experiencing pain. Okay, so basically this allows us to learn. Okay, that's essentially what we're saying here. Pain is a learning experience. I mean, that's how we, that's how we as an organism figure out our environments, figure out life. I mean, when you're a little kid and you're growing, you don't know any better that bright red and stove means this object is really hot, don't touch. Okay, you just say to yourself, wow, that looks pretty bright. I should probably touch it, you know, because we're curious little creatures when we're kids. You know, and, you know, I mean, and mom and dad aren't always around to pay attention, and we just get into things. We're curious organisms. I mean, that's how we learn about our environment, by touching things, climbing on things, putting things in our mouths. Okay, and sometimes we encounter something painful. Okay, so if I touch that red hot object as a little kid, 
all right, and my skin is damaged, plus I experience a lot of pain throughout the process, and I'll show how we do this in a little bit, but I'm, but I'm able to tie that emotional response together with the actual pain, how bad that felt, you're going to learn, maybe I shouldn't do that again. So now you're walking around and you see, wow, something bright red and you reach out to touch it again. And all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, I remember when I touched that, that hurt like crazy. I shouldn't do that again. Okay. And then, you, then you'll learn your lesson. If you don't, and then, I mean, for some people, it may take one try. For some people, it may take a few. For some people, it, take, it may take many. And I'm going to guess if you don't, we'll call that natural selection. Okay. But in the end, pain is good. Now, the receptors, okay, the receptors that are responsible for pain are ones that we mentioned in the last talk, um, nociceptors. Okay, nociceptors, as stated here, are free nerve endings. Okay, they're free nerve endings, meaning they're not encapsulated. They're just endings that are found within tissues. Now, the two areas where you essentially, where you primarily find these nociceptors are skin and connective tissues, and basically connective tissue capsules to be more specific. Okay, so viscera, visceral connective tissue. All right. So they're in a lot of places. They're everywhere. All right. So what these are, nociceptors are receptors that are sensitive to extreme temperature and extreme pressure. Okay, so you know that there are certain mechanical receptors, and hopefully you've been doing your reading. I know I just mentioned mechanoreceptors, and you guys are doing your reading on the various types of mechanoreceptors out there. But you know that there are some mechanoreceptors that are activated by light touch, some by more heavier touch. Okay, but in the end, that's not really a harmful, painful stimulus. Okay, and now if there's an extreme pressure, you know, like some kind of crushing pressure on our skin that's breaking bones or tearing our skin open, that stimulus is going to activate nociceptors, okay, or an extreme pressure, touching something really cold or really hot, all right, and then those nociceptors will be activated, they'll synapse with the spinal cord, they'll release their specific neurotransmitter, and then that information will be sent up to the brain, and we'll say, ouch, this hurts, all right, so essentially, and there's a couple different types of pain that can be coming from these nociceptors. Somatic pain is more what you think about, you know, you know, touching a red hot object from the skin or stretching it or putting too much pressure on a, on a joint by, you know, you may stretch or tear a muscle or put excessive strain on a joint. I mean, I remember when I tore my ACL for the first out of two times, I'll never forget how much that hurt. You know, for some people don't even feel it. I did. And I remember it hurt really bad. Um, so that was an example of somatic pain, and then visceral pain is essentially that's where these connective the nociceptors and these connective tissue capsules are activated. Okay, and typically these are coming from stretch, chemical irritant, or ischemia. Okay, now I'll tell you right now the number one cause of visceral pain is ischemia. Okay, is ischemia, lack of blood flow to an organ. I mean, that's what a heart attack is. When someone's having a heart attack, their heart is becoming ischemic, and it's slowly dying. Okay, and as it's dying, it's going to hurt. Okay, not the whole heart, but parts of the heart. Okay. Um, you know, and then also when it comes to injury, you know, one thing you have to bear in mind, whenever there is tissue injury, there's always going to be inflammation. Okay, and inflammation is a good thing. Okay, inflammation is important because it allows us to basically begin the healing process. Okay, inflammation is a response. I'm not going to go in depth with it now. I'll do lectures just on inflammation later on. But inflammation is a response that basically allows us to basically contain infections. Okay, clean debris you know, clean tissue debris, and then initiate healing once both of those are done. Initiate. Okay. 
part of the inflammation, you know, part of going through the inflammatory response is the release of certain chemicals from mast cells and other cells that are associated with this um, that basically increase the sensitivity of nociceptors. Okay, and the and the more sensitive those nociceptors are, the more pain, you know, the more pain you're going to feel, and the more ongoing the pain is going to be. But that's a good thing. Okay, you know, if you're like, I'll just go with myself for this example. You know, when I blew my knee out. You know, obviously there was pain for a while. Okay, and then same thing with after surgery as well. Um, you know, but that pain is good because that pain told me, you know, while you know during the inf the inflammation that hey, knucklehead, don't walk on your knee. Don't try to go running yet. It's just not it's just not time to heal yet. So basically, that pain allows you to leave that area alone. At least you should, anyways. You know, to which makes it easier to heal. Okay. So keep that in mind about pain. So this is so basically now we've defined pain. Let's talk about how pain information gets to the brain. Okay. So this is a general pathway for conscious pain. Okay. So the first order neurons, um, you know, essentially, essentially the first order neurons synapse with the they synapse with the. Um, they go to the spinal cord and they, uh, oh, where was I saying? I lost my train of thought. Okay, so they synapse in the dorsal root ganglion of the spinal cord. Sorry about that, folks. Um, someone just came out of the room and gave me something. Um, now, one thing you have to bear in mind about the spinal cord is sensory information always enters the dorsal aspect. Okay, motor output always exits the ventral aspect. Okay, um, so that's why we're saying the first order neurons enter the dorsal root ganglion of the spinal of the of the spinal nerves, and then that's and then they synapse with their second order neurons. Okay, and now there are essentially two separate tracks that pain tends to take on its way up to the brain. Okay, the spinal the spinal th uh, thalamic track, and through the what's the other one? I don't have it on here. And the other one is the spinal reticular tract, the spinal reticular tract. And I'll talk about the importance of that in a second. Okay. Talk about the importance of that in a second. Okay. And then the third order neuron, remember, let's members do the math. First order neuron is the receptor. Second order neuron is basically traveling excuse me, from the cord up to the, um, from the cord up to the thalamus, okay, and then the, th and then the third order neuron is from thalamus to cortex, and then the fourth order neuron are the inner neurons in the, uh, in the cerebral cortex that are allowing us to actually, you know, interpret pain, okay, interpret pain. Oh, I've got it right here, so I was covering it up. So let's talk about the importance of pain traveling up these two different tracks here for a second. Okay, so pain. So let's go, so we'll go receptor, you know, spinal cord. Okay. Now then you know they're going to cross over eventually. All right, so let's talk about so let's talk about the importance of the spinal thalamic versus spinal reticular. Okay, so the spinal thalamic tracks. Bear in mind these are essentially going to go to the somatosensory cortex. I'm gonna I'm not gonna draw this out. I'm just gonna write it out and talk about it. Okay, so the somatosensory cortex. Spinal reticular tracts are going to go through the, the reticular, basically the formations, or what we can call the reticular activating system, and eventually to the limbic system. Okay, so let's talk about this for a second. So the somatosensory cortex, that's where we're going to initially say, ouch, this hurts. Okay, where we're going to consciously interpret that pain. Okay, now let's talk about the importance of pain going through the reticular activating system and going to the limbic system. 
Now, remember what the what the RAS is designed to do. Okay, so remember there are these formations that are found within the medulla and the pons. Okay, that are called reticular formations, and then they project up to the thalamus, and then the thalamus radiates the axons all to, to all areas of the cerebral cortex. Okay, and the number one job of the reticular for, of the reticular activating system is consciousness. Okay, basically it either increases or decreases our level of consciousness. And it's relatively simple. If we increase activity of the RAS, our level of consciousness becomes heightened. If we decrease the activity in the RAS, our level of consciousness goes down. Okay, so, and people that typically have permanent injuries to this RAS, for example, let's say they have an injury, you know, below the thalamus, these people are essentially going to be in a permanent coma, okay, because these act, because they're, because because they're not going to be able to get information from these formations up through the thalamus to the cortex to heighten the activity of the brain. Okay, now, so one, when you go through a painful stimulus, you know that, you know, whether you touch a red hot object, someone decides to be a joker and puts a thumbtack on your chair, whatever it may be, you know that you're in a, in a, in a slighter heightened state of awareness, okay? And then two, the limbic system. Remember, the limbic system is essentially where we deal with emotions. Okay, emotional responses and emotional memory. Okay, so this is essentially where this information is going to get stored so we can associate huh, bright red hot object, this hurts like crazy, I don't want to feel like this again, limbic system. All right, so that's basically the importance of these two pain pathways. Okay, and again, this is quite a general, you know, outlook at all this, but, you know, bear in mind, this isn't an upper level neuroanatomy class either. Okay, so that's essentially how pain gets to the brain and where we interpret pain. You know, the main area where we immediately interpret it is the somatosensory cortex, and then this area, the, you know, the the limbic system, this is more for long-term memory. This is, remember, the adaptive aspects we were talking about. So we can learn about our environments and never do what we just did again. Okay. And every now and then, people sometimes experience what's called referred pain. Referred pain is, or misinterpreted pain. So what's going on with referred pain? pain, the brain thinks, the brain thinks that visceral pain is coming from the skin, okay? The brain thinks that visceral pain is coming to the skin. And the reason why is because sensory neurons from the skin and viscera will typically will typically converge and ascend up the same tracks, okay? Not all, not all the exact same, but you'll see groups of nerves ascending up similar tracks from viscera and skin, okay? And then what happens then is the brain is unable to tell the difference between is this pain coming from an organ that's, that's under pressure or is it coming from the skin? So then what happens is since the brain is really unable to not tell the difference between somatic versus visceral, what it does is it, when it sends the, when it, when it interprets this, it basically interprets this as the pain is coming from the entire general area. Okay, now if you look at any textbook or look up images of this, you can see where certain or where where people may experience preferred pain in certain organs. You know, definitely living here in the United States, the most common type of pain we're going to see is heart pain because people have a lot of heart attacks over here. Okay, and. So, and you guys know where people classically feel pain when they're having a heart attack. You know, the shoulders, okay, the jaw, the left arm, you know, sometimes the, sometimes the neck. Okay, so what we're saying here are the, basically the, the skin, okay, the dermat from, you know, the, the receptors from the dermatomes, the skin, the skin receptive fields in these areas, from the neck, shoulders, the jaw, oops, and the left arm, okay, all meet up with the, you know, meet up with the ascending pathways from the heart as well. All right, so now the brain is just receiving one pain stimulus from one nerve track, okay, where all these various individual neurons meet up. So the brain gets an idea of kind of the area where the pain is coming from, but it can't pinpoint a specific location.
Okay, so that's why when somebody when you experience organ pain, you don't feel it hurt necessarily in the organ. You feel it hurt in general areas. All right, and you know this kind of gives an example of how referred pain works. So here the red is representing visceral pain. So let's say I'll just say this is a heart attack. Okay, so the person's undergoing a myocardial infarction. Okay, they're they're experiencing a myocardial infarction. And the heart tissue is dying. Okay, and the you know that pain impulse is being sent to the spinal cord, and then there's also you have to remember there's there's always going to be information coming in from the dermatomes and the skin in this area as well. Okay, so but again, these individual neurons are eventually going to converge into one pathway. Okay, and then ascend upward towards the brain. So by the time this information reaches, you know, reaches the somatosensory cortex, it's getting it, you know, when this information from this track gets to the brain, like I said, it's going to know the, the general area. Okay, but not the, not the pinpointed area. So that's essentially how referred pain works. All right. Um, you know, again, that's important because, you know, as you're going into medicine and you're going to become practitioners um, in, in specific areas, it's going to be very important to understand where people feel referred pain because, I mean, just because sometimes, you know, a, a person may be having a, uh, I don't know, a person may be having a liver issue the liver or gallbladder issue, and they may be feeling it lower in the abdomen than you'd think, you know, in, in an area below where the liver and gallbladder are, okay? Or they, or a person may have some pain in the anterior area around the navel, and you're thinking, well, what's going on there? Maybe it could be gallbladder pain. It could be referred pain from the kidneys. You never know. Okay, so that's why referred pain is important, because like I said, it'll give you, it'll kind of give you an area to understand um, where these pathways are coming from, or the, the pain signals are coming from, and when you get into your more advanced neuroanatomy classes, you learn about the exact specific um, neurons that come in from these dermatomes and these viscera, and which specific um, spinal cord pathways they take to get up to the brain, okay? And then the last topic I wanted to cover in this is something called spinal gating of pain. Spinal gating of pain. So essentially what spinal gating, what we're saying here is we have built-in analgesic mechanisms. And remember, analgesics are, essen are essentially pain relief. Okay, pain relief. So what we have are we have, we have built-in mechanisms to try to not feel pain, to try to slow down pain. Now, these mechanisms are not the most well understood mechanisms in the world, but essentially what they do, you know, or how they're designed, these are designed to stop pain from ascending. They're designed to stop pain from ascending upward. All right, so essentially what happens here then is, you know, the brain is going to get, you know, we'll go through this three, you know, we'll go through this uh, three-order neuron pathway, okay, and um, and then uh, as you're experiencing, as you're interpreting the pain in the cerebral cortex, what will happen is you will, is you will send impulses down, because remember in the spinal cord there are ascending and there are descending pathways, pathways, Okay, so what will happen then is there are neurons that will synapse basically about where the second order neuron is. So these nociceptors are essentially going to synapse with inner neurons in the spinal cord, and then there's going to be a, neuro, there's a neurotransmitter called substance P that is released. Okay, now what these descending pathways do is they essentially block the release of substance P. I'll give you two guesses what P stands for, pain. Okay. And this takes place at the dorsal horn. Remember, the dorsal horn, the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord, is where sensory input enters the spinal cord. So what we're essentially doing is these neurons that are descending down from the brain are blocking these are blocking these these nerve these neurons in the spinal cord from basically getting pain signals up to the brain so the less pain and the less pain signaling that comes into the brain the less pain you're going to feel okay and understanding this is also how you can understand how certain pain medications work like for example the the class of pain meds called opioids
or, or opioids, opiates. Sorry about that. It's been a long day, folks. Opiates. Okay. And when you think of opiates, you think morphine. Okay. It's definitely the most common one out there. Does the same, does, you know, something very similar. Now, there are there are basically areas in the central nervous system as well that produce these uh, mechanisms that you're probably familiar as as endorphins. Okay, there are these there are these I think they're about 11 chain amino acid uh, uh, chemical uh, proteins that essentially do what I just mentioned. They block pain transmission from getting up into the brain. Now think about this for a second. Those of you who've ever had to take a pain medication, okay, whether you're taking a, a you know where you're taking a, a, an opiate and you're blocking the pain transmission you know, from getting up to the brain in general, or you're taking something, I don't know, like Vicodin or not, or basically not an opiate, you know, what's the, what's the one common thing you feel when you take a pain medication? You feel like you just want to pass out or sleep. I mean, that's why they always say on the label, the warning labels, these prescription pain meds, don't operate a motor vehicle, don't drive, okay, because that's essentially what, you know, that's what these do, because, you know, like these, uh, they'll, they'll not only block pain transmission from getting up to the brain, but they'll also lower your levels of consciousness, and the less conscious you are, the less interpretation of pain there is as well. Okay, and then also we can use mechanoreceptors, okay, we can use mecha mechanoreceptors to essentially override the pain, um, you know, the, the pain input to the brain as well, okay, and, you know, more specifically the tactile receptors. Okay, so for example, you guys have all done this before. Um, you know, if you let's let's just go with the, the shin and the coffee table thing. You know, you're walking around, you're not paying attention, bonk your shin. You know, you punt the, the coffee table on accident. But what's the first thing you always do besides sit there and swear for five, ten, eight seconds, depending on who you are? You reach down and you start to rub the area. Okay, and you don't rub the area where you directly hit. You rub the area around where your leg made contact. So what you're doing then? is you're, when you're rubbing your leg, you're rubbing those, you know, the area of the skin that wasn't really damaged, you're applying pressure to those tactile receptors in your skin, and then what you're doing is those, those neurons then are going to essentially override the pain transmission to the brain, and that helps reduce pain. So you can, you know, that's why you always rub it. It's, it's just an instinctive me uh, uh, measure to do whenever you experience pain somewhere, okay? So that's that, and that's essentially pain in a nutshell. Hopefully, this lecture made sense to you guys, and how pain gets from, or just, uh, and how sensory, somatosensory information gets from the, um, from a sensory receptor up to the brain, and then a little interesting talk about pain. Now, tomorrow, I'm going to uh, discuss the general anatomy of the spinal cord in a video, and talk about the basics of withdrawal reflexes as well. I don't have, I don't really have much of the presentation made yet. I'm going to finish that later and do the video tomorrow. So again, folks, if you have any questions on any of this material, don't hesitate to contact me. And as usual, good luck in your studies.